So thank you, Reedy, and thanks to all the organizers. It, we've heard a lot of wonderful theorems over this week. My job today is to convince you that the glass is not half full through all these wonderful theorems, but the glass is still half empty, uh, and that there is a lot more that we need to know. So, and basically every talk about first passage percolation, you're feeling really lucky if you can look at the glass and say that it is half full. Uh, so anyway, we haven't heard much about first passage percolation. Only, the only real mention we got was uh, Daniel mentioned it slightly before his, he mentioned the Eden model, and which is closely related to first passage percolation. So what is the model? We have our state space. We take, uh, un we're going to take a graph for this stock. It will always be um, V2. And on each edge of Z2, we're going to assign a uh, positive number, which is the time that it takes to get across that edge. And then, um, I want to, and then I want to put a probability distribution on this space. What's the probability distribution? So the random variables omega sub e, or e in the edges of z2, are iid with distribution with some distribution, which we'll call mu. And what conditions do I want to put on mu? It doesn't really matter. Uh, the ones that I'm going to put are, um, so mu is continuous and has finite mean. OK, so I put down on each edge of the graph, I put down an independent copy of a finite uh, mean continuous random variable. If you want to think exponential distribution, then there's going to be nothing lost or in the first passage percolation part, not, neither anything lost by restricting to that specific model, nor anything gained by uh, we have some, if we know one specific model, you might think we know a lot more. Actually, in this case, we don't. So what are the, the main things that we want to look at? So I have passage times. So I take two points, x and y and zd, and I take some path gamma that connects them, the time associated with gamma is the sum of all the edges of the edge weights, and then the passage times uh, TXY is the, so I look at all the possible paths gamma from x to y. And I wrote down inf, but one of the things that we can prove is that the inf is actually achieved. So I'll let the geodesic from x to y is the path that achieves the NPM. And it, almost surely there is such a path. Und, under very general circumstances, almost surely that there is such a path. OK, so now what are the main questions that we have? 
So what would we really like to know? Well, I so I can say what points can I reach within a given set of time. So this is the set of all points. Uh, the ball centered at zero with time t is all the points in Z2 such that the time it takes to get from zero to t to get from zero to Z is less than or equal to t. I want to know how does this grow uh, as t gets large. And the answer, so this is a theorem due to Cox and Durant. back from the 70s or 80s. Uh, this is a subadditive process, so you can use the subadditive ergodic theorem to show that um, for any mu, there exists some distribution, which depends on mu, and if I look at 1 over t times b0t, this converges to b star almost surely. So if I look at all the points that are, I can reach in time t, they are roughly this uh, deterministic set b star times t. So the convergence, uh, if you're interested, you can try and figure out what, uh, in what way this convergence is happening, because one is, a, one is a discrete set of points, and then the other is a set in, this is a set in the point. What do we know about B star? Um, so B star is convex. It is, has symmetries all the symmetries of Z2 and it's non-empty and Uh, it has a non-empty interior, and it's not the full plane. But other than that, we really don't know very much. In particular, suppose mu is the exponential distribution. What do I know about, uh, about this limit shape B star? <clears throat> I could ask, is B star the L1 ball? So is it proportional to this? L2 ball? L infinity ball? I can uh, neither say any of those are true, nor rule any of these out, nor rule out any other uh, possibility. So after, after scaling it, I can't rule out any possibility of a convex, uh, convex symmetric shape in the plane. Um, it's believed to be very close to, but not exactly, the L2 ball. But uh, nothing, or at least the, the last time I checked, nothing was known about ruling out any of the, either of these extreme cases. 
So, and it turns out that this question here, our lack of knowledge about the, uh, what the limit shape looks like, what B star looks like, is very closely tied with the lack of knowledge that we have about other sorts of questions. So what other things do I know? So, uh, question, so what other questions do I have? So one thing it would be really nice to know is, so I said that this shape is convex. Uh, it could be that it has flat edges like this. There are models, there are distributions mu where uh, I can get a flat edge in my boundary shape. Uh, that's also a theorem of Durrett and um, I, th I think it might be Cox and Durrett as well. But if you can compare with oriented percolation and you can write down a distribution mu so you get flat pieces. But if I have a, a continuous distribution, uh, there's no continuous distribution known where B star is strictly convex. Um, is the boundary differentiable? This is unknown. And so th these are two big questions. Then a third question, which are related. So exponents. So it's widely believed that there are ex uh, that the variance of the passage time from zero zero to N0 should grow like N to the 2 chi plus some term that's little of 1. And The second one is the wandering exponent here. So I want to find the smallest, uh, the smallest exponent such that if I look in this window here of size into the, into the C plus little o of 1, that uh, I contain the geodesic. from zero, zero to in zero. Um, and trying to know even the existence of these exponents uh, or, and then also to determine them is a major question. And then finally, the last major question is about by infinite geodesics. So this is a question that goes back to Furstenberg. Does there exist a path uh, B minus 2? So does there exist a by infinite path such that for any integer m less than n, the geodesic from bm to bn is uh, 
to the geodesic, I've got this by infinite path. It goes off to infinity in both directions. And for any two points on the path, the geodesic between them is just restricted to the path. And so why is this an interesting question? Well, if you look at an Ising model with random exchange coefficients, so, not, uh, so edges are not, <coughs> uh, all edges are not equally important, but they, you have independent exchange coefficients. This is equivalent to there being the existence of non-trivial ground states in that model. So, uh, and this, this is an interesting open question in physics. And if I look in first passage percolation, this is just a restatement of that problem. So this is a, one of the most important problems in, um, in first passage percolation. And what I would like to do is I'd like to kind of talk about this problem and say how one might, so the conjecture is no. So for any reasonable model, the conjecture is there did not exist by infinite geodesics. So what's my plan for the talk? So first I want to give you some a heuristic for why this conjecture should be true, how you might go about proving it. Then we will, uh, after doing that, we'll look and see uh, what happens in exactly solvable last passage percolation where we know much more. And, uh, and then come back and compare that with what we know for general first passage percolation. Okay, so what is, so this is a heuristic due to Chuck Newman or on existence of by infinite geodesics. So I take two circles here. I take some large value in, and I take two circles. So the first one has radius n. The second one has radius to it. And now, so the first thing I want to note is, say I've got a point V in this circle here. Suppose it's on a bi-infinite geodesic. Well, I can follow out this bi-infinite geodesic. And it must intersect the boundary here and here in two different points, x and y. So, if V in um, inside S in is in a bi infinite. Geodesic, then there exists x and y in the larger circle. Such that V is in the geodesic from x to y. So that's the first uh, just and this is just that the bi-infinite geodesic through V, uh, if it goes through the middle of this big circle, 
then it must intersect the boundary at any time. It, I could have chosen V to be any point in, um, in the larger circle as well. And the sa same statement would hold. So this is the first fact that we want to use. The second thing is we want to put a, an equivalence relation on pairs x, y, and x prime, y prime, where all of these are in S to N. So they're on the larger circle. So when are two pairs equivalent? They're equivalent if the geodesic from x to y and the geodesic from y to, uh, from x prime to y prime agree within the smaller circle. So these two pairs um, agree. These two pairs are equivalent if uh, the geodesic from x to y and the geodesic from x prime to y prime agree inside SM. So if I take another point here, And I look at this, and then I could see that because there's some portion of the path between uh, of the geodesic from x prime to, x double prime to y that disagrees with the geodesic from x to y. Um, inside the small circle. So that's our definition of the equivalence relation. And now, so what is the hope? The hope is, so, so, so far, everything is easy to, uh, well, the first statement is easy to prove. The second is just a definition. The third statement is going to be easy to prove. There exists some constant C such that with high probability, Um, all equivalence classes have at most C in vertices in, um, within, if I just restrict them, if I look at the geodesic restricted to the small circle, they have a constant times n number of, um, of vertices in that portion of the geodesic. This fact is, uh, well, there are most, <clears throat> and this fact I can get just because the geodesic in first passage percolation is, has the number of edges which is bounded by a constant times the distance of, uh, between them, and the, except for a very small uh, set of things, and there's an exponentially small probability that the, um, that the number of vertices in a geodesic is bigger than a constant times the distance between the two points. So now if we put this together, so now I get to the hard part, suppose 
there are little o of n equivalence classes. So if there are, then what do I know? Then there are little o of n squared vertices on vertices inside the little circle, which are on a geodesic. with x and y in the big circle. This is just a simple counting. Each equivalence class has at most a constant in number of vertices. There are less, there are a small number times n number of equivalence classes. So the total number of vertices has to be small in comparison with n squared. Now, so now if I know this, then, so this tells me that the number of points inside this ball by one, the number of points inside this ball, which are on a bi-geodesic, is little o of n squared. There are order n squared vertices inside this ball, and there are a small fraction of those are on a bi-geodesic. So, then the last thing that I need to say is, so if one through four hold, then by the ergodic theorem, um, the probability that zero is in a bi geodesic is zero. Because the probability zero is in a bi geodesic, it's a shift invariant process, so this is the probability that any b is in a bi infinite geodesic. So, by the ergodic theorem, in any uh, shape, in any nice shape that has n squared vertices, there ought to be, if there were a positive probability, there ought to be some positive constant times the, pro, uh, which is the probability that B is in a bi infinite geodesic, times n squared number of points here, which were in a bi infinite geodesic. So if we are able to show uh, four, so one, two, and three are all pretty easy. The last conclusion is just the ergodic theorem. So if we're able to show that there's a small number of equivalence classes here, then we're able to show that there are no bi-infinite geodesics. So this is uh, one reason for the belief in this conjecture. And so it, if I want to understand bi-infinite geodesics, what I really need to understand is the coalescence of finite geodesics. Now, this, so this might look familiar to you if you were around for uh, Alan's talk yesterday. So, because this is exactly the sort of question that he was starting off with in, uh, in his talk yesterday, except he was working in last passage percolation. So, let's have a go back. And remember what kind of one of the key lemmas that he started out with. Yesterday, so he said, consider a rectangle here. So this is side length into the two thirds here, in here.
And then this is the middle third here. And said, consider all geodesics from the um, lower left side to the upper right side. So I take a point here, I get a geodesic here. Take another point here, I get a geodesic. It looks like this. And we are in the case of exponential last passage percolation. And then we put an equivalence relation on any two of these finite geodesics. So we've got, what, n to the four-thirds geodesics, finite geodesics, and we put an equivalence relation on these n to the four-thirds on these geodesics. So the geodesic from x to y is equivalent to the geodesic from x prime to y prime. If it's like here, where if they agree, in the middle third. So, and then what was the, so this was exactly the picture that he was talking about, and then what was the lemma that he had? So he said, let in be the number of equivalents classes and then the expected value of uh, n is, well it's finite but it is order, order one. So it has some mean, and there, uh, we can also say something about the tails. They've got pretty uh, sharp tails. So this picture that we see here, where there's a single equivalence class, is a reasonably common occurrence. And uh, pictures where there's a, a large number of equivalence classes is a rare sort of thing. Well, now what do we see? So now let's go back to uh, New Newman's heuristic and see what do I need in order to get this. Well, it kind of looks like this should, uh, this should be everything that we need to get Newman's heuristic to work. It turns out that there's one thing that is not quite right. So it turns out that <clears throat> the question do, of existence of bi-geodesics in last passage percolation, the answer is different than we expect it to be in first passage percolation, because we actually do, we actually know that there are, in last passage percolation, there are bi-infinite geodesics, but that's for a very trivial reason. Last passage percolation is an oriented model, and so if I take any vertical line or any horizontal line, and I take any two points on there, 
Now, what's the geodesic between these two points? There's only one oriented path between any two points on a horizontal line or any two points on a vertical line. So I know that we're in last passage percolation. In last passage percolation, horizontal lines and vertical lines are always by infinite geodesics. So we can't quite hope to get the full theorem, but what we can hope to do, and this was a question, so uh, I was talking with Daniel Auerberg, and he asked me this question about what happens, uh, are these the only bi-infinite geodesics? And so, and can we get Newman's heuristic to work for, uh, for to show that the only bi-infinite geodesics in last passage percolation are these, uh, are these very special uh, horizontal and vertical lines. Well, it turns out it's not very difficult to say that using this picture here and using this setup here, that this rules out any bi-infinite geodesic whose direction is not in one of the coordinate axes. So, uh, okay, well. So, using uh, the lim this lemma that I just erased, and Newman's heuristic, we and show there are no that that all by infinite geodesics are uh, have direction that is either horizontal or vertical. It is still possible, so we know that there are bi-infinite geodesics where it is exactly a horizontal line or exactly a vertical line. It's possible that there are bi-infinite geodesics which are not bi-infinite, uh, which are not horizontal or vertical lines, but the direction is horizontal. It could, the geodesic could be like this, and then it could go up, and then it could very slowly, slowly uh, increase. So the asymptotic direction is horizontal, but it's not a um, horizontal line. And you can do some more work to rule out geodesics, to rule out paths which are asymptotically horizontal, and to say these are not by infinite geodesics. So then the theorem to is that we can rule those out. So in exponential last passage percolation the only by infinite geodesics almost surely are 
horizontal or vertical lines. So we get a really nice answer to this question in, uh, in exponential last passage percolation. But, I, but if we look at other models of uh, last passage percolation, if I take any other distribution on edge weights, and you ask the same question, what's my answer? The answer is I have no idea what um, whether this same theorem, well, I assume that the same theorem holds for every other model of uh, last passage percolation, but I can't prove it for any other model. And how about for first passage percolation? So what's the state of the art in first passage percolation? Well, we are still a long way off. So. So we can, so for instance, the following question is still unknown. For any model of first passage percolation. If I look at the probability of there exists a bi geodesic, a bi infinite geodesic, which is uh, asymptotically horizontal. So the full conjecture is that there are no bi-infinite geodesics. A much weaker conjecture is I can pick a direction, say the horizontal direction, and ask is there a bi-infinite geodesic that um, is there exists a path G, which is a bi-infinite geodesic, and the horizontal direction of G or the asymptotic direction of G, it's going off on the negative axis to the right and the positive uh, x-axis to the left. What's the probability of this? Well, if you believe the full conjecture, then certainly this should be true, but we are not able to prove this here. So questions like this, horizontal or any other specified direction, it's unknown whether there exists a bi-infinite geodesic with that given direction. And now this next theorem, but so what do we know? And this is a, this theorem is going to be due to a collection of people, Newman, Pisa, uh, and then myself with Daniel Alberg. So the first part is due to Newman and co-authors. So it says the set of directions where there exists by geodesic in that direction with positive probability is countable. So here, I, I wanted to say, uh, is this, I fixed a direction, the horizontal direction, and said, is there a bi-infinite geodesic in that direction? 
And I wondered whether that was a probability zero event or a positive probability event. And what this theorem is saying, well, in most directions, it's going to be a, it's going to be a probability zero event. But I don't know which particular direction. So in all but a countable number of directions, it's a probability zero event. But I don't really know anything about the set of directions where it is countable, where it is a positive probability. We assume that this set is it's countable because it's the empty set, but we can't uh, prove that. <clears throat> what can we prove is um, this set is, so this is the part that Daniel and I did, this set is a subset of the directions where um, the boundary, the, uh, the perimeter of the limit shape is not differentiable. So if we were able to say that the, um, the limit shape has a differential boundary, then we could say in any fixed direction, there, the probability there's a bi-geodesic in that direction is zero. Now this is good, uh, but you might think, well, if in every fixed direction the probability there's a bi-geodesic is zero, then we're a long way towards the, uh, proving the conjecture. And we're some ways, but unfortunately, since there are an uncountable number of directions, it still could be that in any fixed direction, the probability of a bi-geodesic is zero. But the, they just happen in these random sets of directions. And that you could potentially have that in any fixed direction, the probability is zero. But the probability that they exist in some random set of directions is equal to one. OK, so I, this is just one of many ways where what we know about first passage percolation, it, which we think should be <coughs> kind of all these theorems that you've been hearing about for uh, all these exactly solvable models, these all should hold for first passage percolation. In the original paper of KPZ, uh, when they talked about the first introduced the KPZ equation, they mentioned the stochastic Burgers equation and the Eden growth model as two of the models that they were trying to analyze. And, but these models, really the distance between what we know and what we conjecture to be true is, is a really, really vast distance. And I, I would encourage people to uh, try and help out in the general case of uh, there are a lot of interesting open questions. They're generally quite hard questions about bridging the distance between what's known in these non exactly solvable but conjectured to be in the KPZ universality class and the beautiful theorems that we're getting for these exactly solvable models that we've heard about all week. So I'll stop here. And so, are there any questions? Other questions? Let's thank Chris again.